Hi, everyone. Welcome to the 22nd installment of the Galen Data Medical Device Innovation Webinar Series. I'll be your host today. My name is Dwayne Mancini. I'm the CEO and managing partner of Project MedTech. Today, we'll be hearing from Laura Court at Greenlight Guru for a discussion on design controls and best practices for implementation. Today, we'll be hearing about requirements for different medical device classes, overview and practical application of FDA design controls 18 or 820.30, the relationship between risk management and design controls, and practical applications and tips to assist in documenting design controls. But first, a few housekeeping slides and some information on Galen Data. Galen Data is the cloud for medical device makers. The Galen Cloud provides a configurable platform for device to, to cloud connectivity that is compliant to FDA, HIPAA, and CE Mark standards, built on 40 plus years of collective experience developing compliance systems in the medical device industry. The company's goal is to make medical device cloud connectivity available to all at a fraction of the cost while shaving months off the development timeline. Um, I'd like to now welcome our guest, Laura Court. Laura Court is a medical device guru at Greenlight Guru. Um, for the past year, Laura has helped over 100 companies implement their EQMS, including advising on design controls best practices. Before coming to Greenlight Guru, Laura spent time in the medical device industry as a product development engineer, managing products through full product lifecycle into post market support. With that being said, Laura, the virtual stage is all yours. Wonderful, thank you so much. First off, I should ask, you can see my screen, correct? It gave me a different option than it did before this, so I wanna make sure it's working correctly. We can, yep. Perfect, okay, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump on in. So as Dwayne mentioned, my name is Laura Court, and I am a medical device guru here with Greenlight Guru. Um, I should also say medical device guru is very much similar to a consultancy role, since many people don't know what a guru exactly does. A little bit about my background. I previously worked as a product development engineer. I've worked with both small and large companies under a variety of classifications from sterile and non-sterile to class one and two products. Um, I've been through the entire full product life cycle all the way through to that post-market support. I've been with Greenlight now for just a little over a year and so I'm helping to consult with medical device companies of helping them to get their quality management systems up and running, obtaining ISO 1345 certificates, doing a lot of design controls and helping them get their devices to market quicker. Um, I do have just a little bit to talk about for Greenlight here as well. Um, Greenlight Guru is an electronic quality management system software and beyond just a document management system, it has a project workspace for creating your design controls, your traceability matrix and your risk matrix. So one of the main things I do is help our customers implement their design controls according to Part 820 from the FDA. For those of you who are interested in seeing how you can manage development and quality simultaneously with Greenlight Guru's end-to-end -end MedTech Lifecycle Excellent platform, simply head over to our website after this webinar. But enough about Greenlight here. I'm going to remember to change my slide. I wanted to jump on in onto the purpose for today. So we are going to be doing a deep dive into design controls. Specifically, we're going to cover subpart C of 21 CFR part 820, otherwise known as 820.30. Getting into the agenda a little bit, we are going to start with the medical device classification overview. So we're going to touch briefly on class one, two, and three products and which ones are regulated per design controls. Um, most of our time then, we are going to be spent discussing the design controls themselves and what the different components are and some best practices. And then lastly, we are going to touch on risk management at the end and how to take a risk-based approach to your design and to your quality management system as a whole. Perfect. So jumping on in for today. So as I promised, brief overview of our different classifications. So the classification of your device is based on your device's risk, your invasiveness, and the impact of the patient's overall health. So there is an enormous difference between the optimal path to market for manufacturers. It's gonna depend highly on the classification that your device is. That's why it's very important to start um, determining what that classification is going to be on the early stage of development. Knowing your classification is gonna help you to prepare and also allocate your resources needed for that regulatory approval. 
So starting off, we have our class one devices. So first off, definition around class one devices. They are not intended for use in supporting or sustaining life or of substantial importance in preventing impairment to human health, and they may not present a potential risk of illness or injury. So there's approximately 40% of the market for medical devices is made up of class one devices. They do have minimal contact to patients or they have a low impact on the patient's overall health. A couple of examples that we see with that class one classification is going to be an electric toothbrush, an oxygen mask, um, reusable surgical scapulas and bandages, for example. Um, class one devices are exempt or not exempt from FDA general controls. However, they are exempt from design controls of themselves. So they're not going to apply and they are not required for the regulatory submission. Medical device manufacturers who have a class one device are still required to implement a quality management system and follow the requirements to ensure you have a quality product as well as registering your device, but you are not required to use design controls. That does not mean it's not best practices, but you are not required per the FDA. When we jump into the class two classification, this is where we are going to become a little bit more complicated and have an overall higher category of risk for your device. So the FDA defines a class two device um, as devices for which general controls are insufficient to provide reasonable assurance of the safety and the effectiveness of the device. This is where we get into products along the lines of syringes, um, blood transfusion kits, contact lenses, surgical gloves, Majority of the class two devices are FDA approved through the market approval uh, pre-market notification or a 510K process, pretty much just a process for determining a substantially equivalence to an already approved product. Uh, class two devices are subject to design controls. So once we get higher than a class one, this is where design controls are going to be very much scrutinized by um, your auditors for the FDA. Once we get into our class three product, they are defined as usually sustaining or supporting life. They are implemented or present a potential unreasonable risk of illness or injury. Only about 10% of the devices on the market today are gonna fall under that class three classification. It's generally extended to permanent implants, smart medical devices or our life supporting systems. So that can be pacemakers, defibrillators, cochlear implants, um, implanted prosthetics, for example. They are subject to FDA general controls and the FDA pre-market approval or a PMA process. The FDA does write that due to the level of risk associated with a class three device, the FDA has determined that general and special controls alone are insufficient to ensure the safety and effectiveness of a class three device. That is where that PMA process comes into play, and we are gonna be looking at doing a couple of very rigorous studies for that particular device. I'm not gonna to go too deep into a PMA process since we are here to talk about design controls, but all of that being said, it is absolutely important to make sure you go through and try to determine your classification at the beginning of your development phase so that you know if you are um, subject to design controls with that class two or class three, or if you are a class one product and aren't required to have them, but still doesn't mean that it isn't best practices. Perfect. So now we are going to start deep diving into design controls. So some people may be asking, what are design controls to start? Um, design controls are an interrelated set of practices and procedures that are incorporated into the design and development process, basically a system of checks and balances throughout the product development life cycle. They are a systematic assessment of the design or an integral part of development. They are going to help us by identifying deficiencies in design input requirements or even discrepancies between proposed designs and requirements that are made evident and corrected earlier on in the development process. That's gonna be done through design reviews, which we're gonna deep dive into here in a moment as well. Design controls are gonna help by increasing the likelihood that the design transfer to production will translate into a device that is appropriate for its intended use. In practice, design controls are gonna help provide manufacturers and designers with improved visibility of the design process. Once again, a lot of that's gonna come down to our design review. Um, from my personal experience, having a robust design control process in place is a night and day difference from a lacking design process, and it's going to ultimately help save you some time and money in the future as well. 
Designers are going to benefit as well from an enhanced understanding of the degree of conformance of a design to user and patient needs. And it's also going to help improve communication and coordination among all the participants in the process. So when I was a product development engineer, my job was 100 times easier when we had design inputs that were defined and verifications that were planned early on. We're going to talk about some of that planning and when's the best time to write some of those activities as well here in just a moment. So what you're seeing on the screen here is a visual representation of design controls. So the diagram that shows what's commonly referred to as a waterfall approach there is also an agile approach that the FDA does accept from a design controls perspective, but for today, we are primarily going to be walking through our waterfall approach. Speaking to this diagram a little bit, you're going to notice that our flow along the green tiles is going to go from our user needs in our top left corner all the way down to the finished product or a medical device down there in the bottom right hand corner there. We're gonna see our verification tests that are go from our design outputs or make sure they're satisfying our design inputs. And we're also gonna see validation tests with the medical device all the way back to our user need. So design reviews, as I've already mentioned a couple of times, it's gonna be a pretty common theme throughout um, the presentation today. But you can see our design reviews up on the top right. They are gonna take place at very strategic times and at each stage of the process. So it's not just a one-time process to be done, it will do that multiple times throughout product development. But in practice, feedback loops should be required between each phase of the process and previous phases, representing a very iterative nature of product development. So keep this visual in mind, we're gonna start deep diving into um, the different elements of our diagram here, but definitely keep this visual in mind as we go through today. Perfect, so our slide here, this is just going to show us what of the different topics we are going to touch in on today and the fact that part 820 uh, or 820.30 does cover each of these different items. So the very first place we need to start is with our design planning, which is subpart B of 820.30. Some people might be wondering what happened to section A. Section A is just the general introduction to design controls, saying that they're applicable to class two and three devices, which we already covered going through our different classifications. From design and development planning, it is needed to ensure that our design process is appropriately controlled and the device quality objectives are met. So the plan must be consistent with the, remi with the remainder of the design control requirements, we're going to talk through some elements that are typically addressed in that design plan. So typically we would see a description of the goals and the objectives of the design and development program. So what is being developed? Um, we're going to see any delineation of organizational responsibilities with this respect to assuring quality during the design and development phase. This is going to include interface with any contractors as well. So we need to make sure that we're identifying any of our major tasks to be undertaken, any milestones or deliverables for each of those tasks as well, as well as starting to describe what our individual or organizational responsibilities for completing each of those tasks are going to be. So that can be identifying what staff is needed, what resources are needed. This is typically done through a Microsoft project document, for example. You might have an Excel document. This can be documented in multiple ways, but it's all coming back to being part of that design plan. Um, you need to make sure as part of that scheduling as well that we are scheduling major tasks to meet our overall program time constraints. So again, that's going to be in that project file, that Excel file. Uh, but with that, we need to make sure we're identifying our major reviewers and our decision points. So we need to know where our major milestones are going to be in a project. Um, we also need to make sure we have a selection of reviewers. So the composition of our review team and the procedures that need to be followed with any design documentation controls and notifications for any of our activities. So if something happens, when do we need to elevate or escalate issues to our stakeholders? With the plan to the extent possible, we need to be, as I mentioned, identifying our resources and our personnel required. This is going to be your project team. I typically have seen this represented by a minimum of somebody from quality, regulatory, manufacturing, product development, and also the marketing and business development as well. Uh, the constraints such as applicable codes and standards and regulations should also be identified as part of that project planning. So typically, unless a manufacturer has experience with the same type of device, 
this plan initially is going to be limited in scope and detail. So I know I listed out a lot of different things to include there. The very first time you do this um, project plan that may not have all those details in it, in that is quite all right because design and development is always an iterative process. So this plan is going to be a living document that is updated, reviewed, or approved as part of those design evolves. I would love to sit down and say that you're gonna do your design plan and it's just gonna be one and done and it's gonna go perfectly. Never the situation, at least in my own experience, that is why that um, design document is going to be a living document. And I apologize, Wayne, please let me know if there's terrible background noise happening on my end. A large truck just pulled up outside my front of my house. So this is how we know it is um, a live uh, webinar going on. You get unexpected things popping up. You can hear it, but it's it's totally okay. Yeah, it's just every once in a while. It's totally fine though. Perfect, okay. If it gets too bad, let me know and we'll make sure I can switch over and we'll fix it. Perfect, okay, so continuing on. Now we are gonna start getting into the meat of our design controls, starting with our design inputs. So our de design inputs are going to mean our physical and performance requirements of a device that are used as a basis for our de device design. So you may have noticed within that um, representative picture of the waterfall diagram, you would have saw that our diagram actually started with user needs. So this is where the standard itself gets a little interesting because included in the section for design inputs is the concept of user needs. They are not strategic, they are not listed out on their own, but rather included as part of the design inputs. So from the design controls graphic, as you can remember, we saw those user needs. They were tied directly to the intended use of our device, as well as the indications for use, which is gonna describe the use environment for the device and any user needs as far as um, they're typically qualitative in nature. They often determined by the marketing team. I always laugh and say as a product development engineer, I never liked user needs because they tend to be vague because the patient just knows that they want the product to be pocket sized, for example. And I want to translate that into what exact size requirements does that mean? Um, so your design inputs are going to encompass those user needs, but we need to make sure that they are often developed by um, user facing personnel and they need to be separated out then. You may have heard that sometimes these can be brought in through documents called MRDs, marketing requirement documents, or they can also be through PRDs for product requirements documents. They can get back to you ultimately in a variety of ways, but it is very important to make sure you are identifying those user needs out of your design inputs. So from part 820, it's gonna specify that our design inputs must be appropriate and address the device's intended use. It needs to address the needs of both our user, so our doctor or caregiver, and that can also be the patient. So that's where you need to look at who your end user is going to be, but also anyone else that needs to interact with the device between now and that end user. And your manufacturers must also have procedures to resolve any incomplete or conflicting or ambiguous requirements. So design inputs do need to be reviewed and approved. And that's where, again, we're gonna talk about design reviews. I warned you that it is going to come through all over our presentation today. Um, diving a little bit deeper into design inputs, they are truly the starting point for product, develop, for product design. So the requirements which form the design input establish a basis for performing subsequent design tasks and validating the design. Therefore, developing a solid foundation of requirements is the single most important design control activity, in my opinion. That is why our design inputs must be comprehensive. This may be quite difficult for manufacturers who are implementing a system of design controls for the first time, but trust me, the process gets easier with practice. It may be helpful to realize that design input requirements fall under three categories. Virtually every product on the market is going to have requirements of these three types. Our first one is going to be our functional requirements. So specifying what the device does, focusing on the operational capabilities of the device, and even the processing of inputs or the resultant outputs, for example. Our second type is going to be our performance requirements. So specifying how much or how well the device must perform, addressing issues such as speed, strength, response time, limits of operation even, this is going to include any quantitative characteristics of the use environment, including, for example, temperature, um, shock, humidity. The requirements concerning reliability and safety are also gonna fit under those performance requirements. 
Lastly, we are going to get into interface requirements, our third type. So this is going to specify our characteristics of the device, which are critical for compatibility with external systems. So specifically those characteristics, which are gonna be mandated by the external systems and outside the control of the developers. Um, one interface which is important is going to be the uh, case of our user or our patient interface. So this is where we can even think around ergonomics. So is our patient or our user, need, do they need to be able to use this with one hand, for example? Um, part 820 also states that design input requirements should be unambiguous. That is, each of our requirements should be able to be verified by an objective method of analysis, inspection, or testing. This is where we're going to get into some of those details of documenting our design verification tests at the same time as we are writing our inputs. That is not to say that you are going through and doing your verification tests at that same time, but rather you're thinking about how you're going to be testing them because that can influence how you write your design inputs. Big thing to keep in mind as well is that when you get into those design inputs, if you are writing specific um, diameters or measurements, for example, as part of that not being unambiguous, when we write a diameter of 3.5 millimeters, for example, that is technically considered ambiguous because we don't have a tolerance range listed for that dimension. So that's where we need to expand it to say 3.500 plus or minus 0 0.00 millimeters, for example, because unfortunately we're never gonna hit that um, measurement exactly head on. So that is where we need to make sure that we are truly identifying and taking it down to the appropriate level of detail from a design input standpoint. Last thing, the environment in which the product is intended to be used should also be properly characterized. So this is where you need to identify, is this product gonna be used in a laboratory, in a home, in an ambulance, um, in Colorado in the middle of winter, for example. So it's gonna take into consideration all of our temperatures, humidities, um, everything along those lines from an environmental standpoint. So I talked a lot through design inputs there, but as a reminder, they are truly going to be what's going to set you up for success moving forward by identifying our verification activities early on. So that's why I like to make sure we very much emphasize our design inputs, um, which encompasses our user needs as well, because they are going to be the baseline for our product. Perfect. Once we get through our design inputs here, make sure my screen changes. Oops, there we go. We are now going to dive into our design outputs. So we have our user needs established. We have our design inputs established. Now, what are our design outputs? So the fun definition from part 820 states uh, that design output means the results of a design effort at each design phase and the end of the total design effort. So the finished design output is the basis for the device master record. The total finished design output consists of the device, its packaging and labeling, and the device master record. So there are going to be drawings, specifications, other documentation describing the device and its components, materials, construction. Your quality system requirements for design output can be separated out into two elements. First one is going to be that it must allow evaluation of conformance of the design to the design input requirements. So that's where we're gonna be verifying that our design outputs are meeting our design inputs. Our second one is going to be that the form and content of the design outputs must be suitable for testing. So that's, can we test it as part of our verification? First issue is important because the typical development project produces voluminous records some of which may not be categorized as design outputs. On the other hand, design outputs must be reasonably comprehensive to be effective. So as a general rule, an idea in design outputs is if it's a work product or a deliverable item of a design task, it should be listed out within our design plan to state that this is a design output, it is a deliverable from some of our activities. Um, the second part there with the form and content, it's important because our design output characteristics are all key aspects of our design and therefore has to be expressed in terms which are going to allow adequate verification and validation. So your design outputs must contain or make reference to an acceptance criteria. Um, design outputs, they need to be documented, they need to be reviewed, they need to be approved. Shocker there on the review point, I know. Speaking of review and approval, we are now gonna start deep diving into what our design reviews look like. As you've already heard, I've said design review probably 15 times already. 
it is an absolute important subject and going to be all throughout design and development. So we need to make sure we spend some time on design reviews. Perfect. Okay. So as with the other two, get it out of the way. The actual definition for design reviews out of part 20 is a documented, comprehensive, systematic examination of a design to evaluate the adequacy of the design requirements, to evaluate the capability of the design to meet these requirements and to identify problems. So in general, formal design reviews are intended to help provide a systematic assessment of design, result, design results, including the device design and the associated designs for production and support processes. So it's gonna to help to provide feedback to our designers on any existing or emerging problems. Um, we are going to assess our project progression and also help provide confirmation that our project is really to move on to the next stage of development. So we're gonna get all those key stakeholders together to go through a lot of that information. A lot of different types of reviews occur during the course of, of designing a product. As I mentioned before, it's not just a one and done review. It's gonna be all over the place. So they can be both internal or even externally focused. An internally focused design review is gonna be on the feasibility of the design and the producibility of the design with respect to manufacturing and support capabilities. Our external focus is where we're gonna be looking at our user requirements. That is, the device design is reviewed from the perspective of our user itself. Very large squeaky noise, always fun. Uh, the nature of our reviews changes as the design progresses. So during the initial stage, our design reviews are going to be around issues related to our design input requirements. That's going to be our main focal point. We're then going to move into the main function of the reviews to evaluate and confirm the choice of solutions being offered by the design team. So this is going to be issues such as the choice of material, the methods of manufacturing. Those are going to become more important as part of our design reviews. During our final stages, we are going to be looking at issues related to the verification, validation, and even the production is going to be more our focal point for design reviews. So control of our design review process is achieved by developing and implementing a formal review program consisting with quality system requirements. So let's talk a little bit about the aspects of a design review um, and what should be covered in that project plan. So biggest thing in that project plan is going to be number and types of reviews. So it's pretty well accepted fact that the cost to correct design errors is going to increase the farther our design nears completion and the flexibility to implement an optimal solution is going to decrease. So for an example, when I worked with injection molding components previously, after the mold was created or even under development, if we had to go through and make a design change, it is going to be much more costly um, and, and add a lot of time to our overall timeline compared to if it's something that we had identified at the beginning um, and made that and implemented it into our initial mold design. There are many approaches to scheduling formal design reviews that are valid. Uh, what is important is that you're going to establish a reasonable rationale for the number and types of review based on sound judgment. I know that can be very vague. Ultimately, can you support an argument to an auditor to say, we did a design review at each phase and why you did it. So one thing to consider is also gonna be our selection of reviewers. So in determining who should participate in a formal design review, you need to consider the qualifications of our reviewers. What types of expertise do you need based on what you're reviewing? Um, but also there's a primary concept of the independence of the reviewers. So formal design reviews should be conducted by people who have technical competency and experience at least comparable to the developers. For small companies, this may require an outside consultant to be retained to participate in the evaluation of the design, um, primarily because our formal design reviews should include at least one individual who does not have direct responsibility for the design stage under review. That is going to be our person known as our independent reviewer. That can be sometimes, um, it can be another engineer on your team, it can be an outside consultant, but it needs to be somebody who doesn't have the direct responsibility of what's being reviewed. It does not have to be the same person for every design review. If you have one design review focusing on the electrical part of the components, another design review focusing on a mechanical side of the components, that can very much be different people who are the independent reviewers for those design reviews. So big question, how does design reviews actually take place? 
Uh, most formal design reviews are going to take a form of a meeting, and there are many approaches to conducting design reviews. In simple cases, the technical assessor and the reviewer may be the same person, often a project manager or an engineering supervisor, and the review meeting is a simple affair in the manager's office, does not mean you get away from the requirements for documenting meeting minutes and also any action items. Um, for more elaborate reviews, this is where we're going to get into detailed written procedures. They're desirable to ensure that all of our pertinent topics are discussed, conclusions are accurately reported, action items documented and tracked. So again, surprise, surprise, design reviews are going to come down to documenting and reviewing those documents appropriately, making sure we have meeting minutes, action items listed, and documenting all of the individuals who were a part of that design review as well. Perfect. Okay. I know I talked a lot there about design reviews, so we are going to keep moving through our design um, control items. Next, going into our design verification, but as always, keep design reviews in the back of your head. As I mentioned, you're still going to hear me talk about them here and there as we go through our last items here. They are absolutely important, and they are iterative throughout the entire design and development process. So on to the fun part, in my opinion, the actual testing. First question, what is verification? So according to Part 820, verification is a confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that specified requirements have been fulfilled. Basically, verification testing is testing an is a testing and an examination to ensure that our design outputs meet our design inputs requirement. You're essentially asking the question, was the product design right from the engineer's point of view? So as I mentioned earlier, verification should be planned early on in the design process. That's when you're identifying your design inputs. You should also be assessing and determining what sort of verification methods you can use for that particular design input and what acceptance criteria do you need as part of that verification test as well. Um, we have different types of review of verification activities as well. They are conducted at all stages and all levels of device design. The basis of your verification is going to be kind of a three-pronged approach, including tests, inspections, and analysis. The manufacturer should select and apply appropriate verification techniques based on generally accepted practices for technologies. A um, few examples of verification methods and activities Worst case analysis of an assembly to verify that components are rated properly and not subject to overstress during handling and use. So for a worst case analysis, an example would be for a cranial fixture device, we would set it to a max load at a full extension of the device itself to meet that worst case scenario. We're also going to see this with package integrity testing. So we are going to be looking at the fullest package that we can maintain and put it through its max dose of sterilization and then subject it to fall test and shake test and meet that worst case scenario for our packaging as well. With a couple other verifications, this is where we're going to see biocompatibility testing for our materials and also bio burden testing for our products to be sterilized as well. With all other design controls, as I've said multiple times, yes, you must document you're going to document this through test methods, so you need to have a protocol in place. You're going to document all of your results as well and any individuals that have been involved. So you're going to have protocol reports. You can bring in reports for your biocompatibility testing. If you've used an outside source, you still need to bring in their final reports as part of your final report for that verification testing as well. Perfect. Hey, Laura? Yes. We do have one uh, question that came up here. Absolutely. Can a non-responsible reviewer be an expert on the regulatory consulting firm being used for MDR ISO 13485? Can you repeat the beginning of that? Are we looking at, can somebody be an expert reviewer or an independent reviewer? Yeah, can a non-responsible reviewer be an expert on the regulatory consulting firm being used for ISO 13485? So as part of design reviews, you can bring in anyone that you deem is necessary. So if you want to bring in that expert as a non-responsible person, your design reviews are not limited to just the person responsible and an independent reviewer. I always recommend bringing in all of your key stakeholders or anyone who's going to have valuable insight into what you're reviewing at that time 
So if that non-responsible expert for MDR or 1345, for example, needs to come in, absolutely bring them in as part of that design review. It's only going to help you by potentially identifying any issues early on. Okay, great. Perfect. Wonderful. Okay. So now that we made it through design verification, we are going to start on validation. And if I haven't already messed up, if you're like me, you like to say verification and validation at the wrong time. However, it's very important to make sure you get them right because um, you're going to see our definition for validation means that it is a confirmation by examination and provision of objective evidence that the particular requirements for a specific intended use can be consistently fulfilled. So whereas verification is a detailed examination of aspects of a design at various stages in the development, design validation is going to be the cumulative summation of all efforts to assure that the design will conform to our user needs and our intended uses. So verification, we're asking, was the product designed correctly? Validation, we're asking, was the correct product design from the user standpoint? So this is where we're going to see, I always have to repeat it in my head to myself, design inputs go to verifications, design uh, or user needs go to validations. So just as with the verifications, the validation should be planned early on in our design process. So while we are writing those user needs, we need to start thinking about how we are going to be validating those user needs in the future. This is going to be through identifying our performance characteristics that need to be assessed and what validation methods need to be used, as well as that acceptance criteria for those tests as well. Um, a couple things on validation methods as well. So many medical devices do not require clinical trials. However, devices require clinical evaluation and should be tested in the actual or simulated use environment. So if somebody needs to use it one-handed as part of that validation, you should be testing to make sure it can be used one-handed, for example. Um, tests performed on defined initial production units. So some manufacturers, obviously won't be calling out anyone specifically, but some manufacturers have historically used their best assembly workers or skilled lab technicians to fabricate, best, to fabricate their best case test articles. But this practice can actually obscure problems in the manufacturing process. That's why it can be beneficial to ask your best workers to evaluate or critique the manufacturing process by trying it out, by being in the pilot production. Um, but the, really the pilot production for those validation units should simulate as closely as possible the actual manufacturing conditions. Um, validation should also address your product packaging and labeling. And finally, surprise, surprise, yes, you must document your validation activities. Once again, that is going to be through protocols and reports um, documenting any individuals that were used as well. Typically, your detailed results are going to be contained in a variety of separate documents and then summarized into one final validation report for this particular product. Perfect. So I think that's going to take us through our primary design control items there, our user needs and inputs, all the way through to our verifications and validations. So our next major topic, once we get through our primary testing here is going to be talking about design transfer. So now that we've gone through, um, did our final testing from a design control standpoint, we need to transfer it over to manufacturing. So the part, eight defi or part 820 definition states that each manufacturer shall establish and maintain procedures to ensure that, that the device design is correctly translated into production. So we need to make sure we designed it, but now we have to make sure that we can actually produce it correctly. So as we discussed earlier with production and process controls, production specifications need to ensure that manufactured devices are repeatedly and reliably produced within your product and process capabilities. If a manufactured device deviates outside of those capabilities, your performance can be compromised. Thus, the process of encapsulating the knowledge about the device into the production specifications is critical to our overall device quality. One important quality or a concept to discuss when we're talking about design transfer is concurrent engineering. So concurrent engineering is the involvement of production and service personnel through the design process. This is going to ensure a mutual optimization of our characteristics of device and its related process. Um, never assume that everything, um, the people that are assembling the product or that you know more than them, one of the most, I guess, humbling parts when I was a young engineer starting out in manufacturing 
was going out onto the floor itself and getting input from the individuals who are making the product every day. They knew hundreds of times more about the product than I did and were able to help me as far as identifying issues that they had discovered or ways to make it easier to assemble so that we could get more of these um, high quality products out to our different manufacturers or out to our different clients. But they were also great at helping to come up with solutions because they assemble these products all day, every day. And so they knew what they wanted to see and what some easier ways were going to be. So I always recommend bring manufacturing into your design meetings, bring them into that design and development process early on because they are going to have valuable insight that you should very much consider at the beginning of the design and the development phase. Perfect. My <laughs> both favorite and least favorite topic to talk about, design changes. I would love to say that we design a device and it is what it is and it does not change. Not going to be our situation here. Design changes are going to happen. So first course, our definition from part 820 is going to state that each manufacturer shall establish and maintain procedures for the identification, documentation, validation, and where appropriate verification, review, and approval of design changes before their implementation. So there's going to be two main aspects of design controls. First one is going to be our design reviews. Like I said, they're going to come up everywhere. And the second is going to be our change control and our document control. So design reviews are to assess the impact of our design changes on verification and validation and any other aspects of the design process. So even when you're going through um, a minor change, you still need to make sure you're appropriately reviewing that to make sure it doesn't have any impact on tests that have been completed. Um, the other with get into change control, it is truly to track the documentation and the revision history of all of the documents as well as for any of the critical components that we've affected as part of our change. So verification and validation activities of the changes are very important. This is going to be relatively easy in the beginning of the design process when verification haven't been done yet or verification and validation haven't been done yet from a design control or change perspective. However, it is even more important to evaluate um, any changes thoroughly later on in the design process, especially once the product has been transferred to manufacturing, to evaluate what impact it's going to have on testing that's been completed, manufacturing processes that are already in place. Um, that is where you get into anytime we have a design change, we need to look at our impact to our product, our process, any risk to the product itself as well, as well as any regulatory impact that we're going to have as part of those changes. I always laugh and say, hug your document control, because they are the ones who are going to be helping you to document a lot of that information and make sure it's properly filed um, for any changes that occur. Perfect. So next biggest question, where is all of this documentation going to go as part of this design and development process? That is going to be our design history file. Design history files are defined as containing or referencing the records necessary to demonstrate that the design was developed in accordance with the approved design plan and the requirements of this part. All our records created under each design control element should be captured within your DHF. You're going to see in each section of the design controls in subpart of 820, the words shall be documented in the DHF are going to be everywhere. I want to emphasize that it says or referencing. So that is where we get into a very valuable part of an electronic QMS because to have the DHF referencing the design records rather than having it compile all of those records into one giant binder is a lot easier. Save you a couple paper cuts, speaking from my own personal experience as well. Um, there is no specific requirement within ISO 9001 or 1345 for a design history file specifically. However, of course, if you're going to be marketing within the US, you need to be compliant with the FDA, which does require a design history file but you will see a lot of overlap between the requirements that are in the design history file with 13485 um, from a documentation perspective. Okay, perfect. Last couple things to talk about, we're gonna talk through traceability and risk to wrap us up here. So traceability, this here on the screen is actually a look at the design control matrix for a total knee implant system that we built within Greenlight. Until manufacturers move to an EQMS with this functionality, the traceability matrix is typically maintained through an Excel file. Um, but this is where we are going to see a very direct correlation between our design inputs to our verifications, outputs back to our inputs, user needs to validations. Ultimately, the goal of your traceability is to tell the story of your design, 
Um, so for our knee implant here, we can see all the way from our user knee, for which we need to be able to fit appropriate um, ranges of motion, all the way through to the MRI review validation in the cadaver lab study that we completed as part of that validation. Traceability is truly just telling a story of your product. Okay, last big topic to talk about for today is going to be our risk management around design controls. I know sometimes a risk is viewed as a four letter word. However, risk is going to be an invaluable part of your design and development process. Um, so up on the screen here, you can see a risk cycle that follows 14971 or ISO 14971 for risk management. To talk through this quickly, you're gonna notice in the bottom right hand corner that it refers to design controls. I think it's yep, right down here, there we go. So our user needs, our design inputs, our outputs, verifications, validations, these are all going to be mitigations for our risk. So they're gonna tell us a story of how we're mitigating our risk through our design activities. Risk is gonna tell the story of certain design controls. So your risk analysis is going to lead to more design inputs which lead to more design outputs. So this is where we're going to see that once we've identified a potential risk within our item, that is going to have us implement a new feature into a design input. So this is where doing risk concurrently with your design controls is gonna help you to identify any potential pitfalls early on. Um, so first of all, I should say, what is risk management? It is a systematic application of management policies, procedures, and practices to the task of identifying, analyzing, controlling, and monitoring risk. Keyword there is going to be control. So you are right in the definition, risk and design control are tied together. You have to work on risk management during design. Absolutely do not wait till the end to do risk. As we have talked about, the longer you wait to implement any changes, the more expensive it's going to be become because you're going to have to change design items. You're going to have to change around um, personnel that you've already identified. So that's where if you start it early, it's gonna help you move forward and save you time and money. Um, last couple slides here. So risk, first one, the longer you wait, the tougher it gets, I should say, and more expensive that it's gonna become as well. It's going to become exponentially more as you wait later on. We need to understand the purpose. So we need to know what our intended use of our product is going to be. If this is why our user needs are so important. We are also gonna be looking at the value of documentation. So for FDA inspectors, ISO auditors, other regulatory bodies, the number one cause of 483 warning letters from the FDA are for design controls or risk, or I should say rather a lack of them. Um, and lastly, with risk, not only is risk important to mitigate using design controls, but risk is also mitigated by your quality management system. We discussed that a little bit earlier as well. ISO 14971 was released in 2007. Since then, there has been a large greater emphasis on risk on regulatory bodies. Um, some of the ways that they're seeing this is throughout things like your management reviews, your training records, calibrations, purchasing requirements, supplier monitoring, all of those different sections that we find throughout both 1345 and Part 820 as well. Um, so we should be managing risk through the entire product life cycle and remembering that managing risk is the reason behind all of Part 820 requirements in general. Our goal is to design and develop medical devices that are safe and effective for our users. Implementing these requirements are gonna help us do just that. I think that takes us to the end of my slides here. Do we have some more questions, Dwayne? We do. The questions are rolling in. I do wanna read just a comment um and kudos to you for the presentation so one of the comments was thank you so much the webinar uh was very informative and they'll be re-watching it multiple times and sharing with their college or colleagues so uh great presentation so i wanted to read that because we do have a lot of questions and so um i don't know if i was going to get back to that before <laughs> we wrapped up um the, the first question was does validation require preclinical testing for example class three devices for class three devices, that is where you do need to deep dive into that PMA process. A lot of the times you are going to be working with a university or a teaching hospital, for example, to get those clinical trials up and running. So we would be looking at doing possibly some of that pre-clinical work um, that can be done through first in human trials, where you have that type very initial low amount of users or low amount of participants as part of that clinical trial. 
um, and then slowly amping up into your large pivotal um, clinical study that you will be using. So you will have some of those kind of beginning activities happening for a class three product specifically. Okay. When when will 13485 and CFR 820 be aligned to be acceptable in Europe? In my dreams, it would be today. Um, I do think that is one thing we are seeing is a general move from the FDA to be compliant or to be aligned with 1345. There is a lot of overlap between the two. I always like to say, if you are going for 1345 compliance, you are going to hit 95 plus percent of the requirements that you need for part 820 so if you're going towards one they have a lot of overlap but we are seeing a movement from the fda to become compliant with both of them and to have a lot more alignment between those standards so i'd love to be able to say it's coming tomorrow the fda won't tell me that i would love for them to um, but i do think we are seeing a lot of that movement and it will be coming awesome um how do you quantify that benefit outweighs risk that is going to be through your benefit risk analysis. So once you go through all of your risk activities or as you're going through them, you're gonna to get to a point where if you, for example, make a needle any less dull because the needle could poke the clinician, for example, and cause them undue harm. However, if you make it any less dull, it's gonna be of no benefit to my patient because it's not going to deliver the medicine that they require as using that um, needle, for example. So this is where once we get to typically done towards the end of risk or towards the end of the product life cycle, we are gonna start writing reports to say that we cannot reduce this risk any further because it's going to be of no benefit to my patient. This is where we do see a little bit of difference between FDA requirements around a BRA and um, ISO 1345 for that MDR and EU certification, CE mark, all of those. FDA does not require a benefit risk analysis to be written for any low mitigated risk levels. So if you're at that low, they automatically assume that you cannot reduce it anymore because it's a low risk to the patient or clinician. Once we start getting into European markets and going for that CE mark, they want you to have that benefit risk analysis for every risk level within your general risk matrix or for every harm that you have because they want to make sure you have fully analyzed any potential reduction in risk that you can do, and they want it clearly documented on paper. Um, so that's where you're gonna be writing benefit risk analysis. There are a lot of great resources online. If you are looking for anything specific, there are a couple of guides on how to write a BRA as well. It's it's um, funny, I just have to comment on this, that you use BRA because that is also what we would use for a biological risk assessment. And oh. this is hitting on why the med tech industry is very confusing sometimes with acronyms. <laughs> Absolutely, that's why I always try and say it first and then say the acronym, because I play that game all day with customers where different companies call things different names and yeah. make sure you're specifying which one. So a benefit risk analysis, not a biological risk. <laughs> yeah, so um, Laura, I have a question. Um, so so when when you're going through these design history files and you're going through this this risk analysis, does that determine, um, like as you switch designs, as you switch materials, is that what's kind of leading the charge on when you need and, and how you need to address the biocompatibility of medical devices as well and, and when you need to address that when you make changes? Is, is this the process that's kind of determining that? Absolutely. So especially when you get into biological evaluations and possibly any impact to that, you are really going to be evaluating that. Obviously, during the initial design and development, when you're selecting your specific materials, but then also anytime you're making a change, you need to evaluate whether you're impacting that biological evaluation. This is where we'll see in the European markets as well, there is a bigger emphasis on biological evaluations that I've seen, especially with my previous company, um, where if we changed a mold release that we used as part of our uh, manufacturing process, that could impact our biological evaluation results and our bio burden testing that we had done because now there's a potential new substance that's been introduced and that could have an interaction with our patients. So this is where you may think that you are changing the smallest thing possible from a manufacturing process or design change process, but truly you need to look at where it's gonna impact. Biological evaluations and bio burning needs to be a large one of those things that you're evaluating for any changes. Yeah. Um... And I can talk for a whole other hour about biocompatibility because that was my previous life, but we did get one other question in here. Um, at what point in the product development life cycle 
uh, for example, R&D, feasibility, prototype, et cetera, should a startup company, de startup company developing a medical device start focusing on design control? That is a fantastic question that we get asked quite often. So I also always like to say, if you are still in the phase where you are writing on the back of bar napkins, I'd love to say I've never found one of those in an old DHS, that would be a lie. If you are still in that phase of just writing in, um, like I said, bar napkins, you're changing materials or design control or design changes every hour, every two days, just trying to determine what's gonna be the best path moving forward may not be the best time to start documenting design controls or design inputs um, specifically. You should already have some of your user needs because if you're developing a product, it's because you've identified that there is a lacking area within the industry and that this product is needed. From a design input standpoint, once you get past that initial prototyping phase where you're, like I said, changing design every two hours within your system trying to figure it out, Yes, you should have all that documented within a lab notebook, just so you know for yourself what you've done, so you don't keep redoing the same thing over and over again. Um, but then once we get towards the last maybe two designs, or we've had, okay, we think we know we're gonna go with this one forward, just start documenting some design inputs. It doesn't need to be all that formal, but you are gonna save yourself a lot of work in the future if you are documenting these within your lab notebook, for example, during that prototyping phase even, because I've seen a lot of companies have to do the game of retroactively writing all of your design inputs and your user needs. And it's hard to remember back that far. I can't remember what I had for breakfast, let alone why I was developing something um, multiple months ago. So it never hurts to document things within a lab notebook at the very beginning. But then once you get past that very quick rapid fire changing of prototyping, then we would start to look at formally documenting design inputs. But again, user needs, we should already have a lot of those as well. Okay. So the we got another question, uh, it's actually from the same person. One comment was, great presentation, very much enjoyed it, well done, very helpful. And then the question was, how do you determine the number of units necessary to be built for each verification and validation? Are there standard numbers of units to be built? This is where we're gonna break out our statistics textbooks from either high school or college, because this is where we need to look at, based on the overall risk of their device and also the risk of the testing that you're being completed, how many do we need to meet? So if it's a worst case scenario, there's a couple magical numbers, which I'm going to embarrass myself by not remembering, 30 or more along those lines. Again, this is where you're gonna break out the statistics textbooks to say with 95% competency and 95% um, compliance, I need to collect stats, that is how it's gonna help you to determine what your correct number of samples are going to be. There are a lot of great resources um, within online on how to determine what those numbers should be, but it should also have a risk-based approach. And Duane, I'm sure you know lots around those statistics coming from biocompatibility. It was always a question of how many units do I test or how many of these should be? So right. always come back to the stats book. Yeah, that is also the nice thing about the risk-based approach though, is uh, if you're good at making good rationalizations, then it does benefit you a little bit. Um, all right, Laura, with that being said, um, that is all the questions. Uh, thank you so much for that presentation. Uh, I certainly learned a lot. This is an area I didn't know a lot about, and so um, I was intrigued. There's a lot of good um, questions coming in um, on behalf of Galen Data. Uh, thank you for taking an hour out of your day to, to educate us on this topic. Um, for those who are still listening in, you can uh, go to galendata.com. You can find a recording of this webinar there in the coming weeks. Um, there's also an email on the screen right now uh, for Natalie Boone, who I believe is Laura's colleague, if you want to get a hold of Laura. Um, and then we also have some contact information there for uh, Galen Data as well. So with that being said, thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of the Galen Data data webinar series. Laura, thanks again. Thank you so much. I enjoyed it very much.